the war in Yemen, uh, which is in many ways and beyond conventional um, narratives, a war that extends deep into the past, uh, at least since the 1990s, is a war of attrition, it's a war of aggression by neighboring countries and indeed larger global powers that uh, in involves um, and in necessary, is a necessary destruction to the lives of at least 20 million people in a country that was always on the edge of starvation and hunger in the first place. So it is a, it's a humanitarian catastrophe on the scale that um, um, unfortunately makes it to Hollywood um, 20 years later or um, is a collective scandal and shame for the larger world and a conflict that nevertheless gets minimal attention in mainstream media and thus needs um, immediate attention from both um, specialists but also the general public because it is again a war that uh, involves the, the starvation indeed of hundreds of thousands of people every year, the death from disease and indeed violent death from because of the nature of the conflict itself. Because of the interested uh, parties um, involved in this war of aggression on Yemen, a country that for various um, periods of time had just remained independent, um, both regionally and, and globally, the reason why um, these neighboring and then larger global interests do not want this war of aggression ever um, discussed with much detail uh, is because it's a, it's a scandalous war, a war that has actually very little to do with the interests of the people in Europe or in the United States, and yet it's marketed as something that is of strategic value. So um, keeping it off the mainstream media and keeping the, the language um, in a very narrow, uh, simplistic way helps uh, the um, aggressors in this war to continue with their very illegal and I would say criminal acts without much oversight uh, from uh, the larger world. This narrative that um, identifies in simplistic terms um, a good guy and a bad guy, um, a common approach to describing events in the larger world, um, suffers from one, a lack of historical context, and two, is a distortion of the actual interests um, involved, um, blaming an identifiable um, say boogeyman, um, often um, uh, misplaces the, um, the area of attention um, and indeed the mischaracterizes those who are actually resisting this war, as I mentioned before, the war of aggression, uh, delegitimizes their um, and actually takes away their right to defend themselves. And that's part of the larger strategy of this war is to deny the ability of Yemenis to resist um, the expectations are for them to subordinate themselves to these larger global interests. And by positioning this war as a war, a simple war between good and evil, between black and white, between Sunnis and Shia, it's a, a method of um, approaching um, the characterization of conflicts in the larger world that um, strategically ignores the critical elements behind them, which would have probably given large numbers of people in Denmark, for instance, a reason to doubt the legitimacy of this campaign against Yemen. So it's a strategy that has long been used through mainstream media to obscure the actual reasons why war is being fought, why it's being resisted by Yemenis, and ultimately um, gives uh, illegitimate uh, ground for the continuation of this war, despite the fact that it's starving as a strategy upwards of 20 million people.
uh, Sweden is um, profiting um, as, a, as a supplier of weapons um, and logistics support uh, to some of the participant countries. Um, so there is um, indeed there was heavy investment by uh, the current government and indeed the ruling, the royal family, if you will, of investing personal um, time to lobby uh, Riyadh to continue with their contracts, the supplying uh, the so-called coalition forces with certain types of weapons. Norway has made the effort to actually disinvest um, from the conflict and specifically stated as policy that they will no longer um, sell weapons and services, more importantly services. Scandinavian countries don't necessarily provide uh, the air power, but they provide the kinds of logistical support that's necessary to maintain a campaign that every day brings death and destruction to upwards of 20 million people in the north of Yemen. So Scandinavian countries um, do actually have a role to play. Uh, unfortunately, Sweden has um, f uh, being a member uh, and indeed the uh, head of the, and chair of the uh, Security Council for the last uh, couple of months has been very actively trying to obscure uh, some of the details of uh, and the complexities of this war, continue with the narrative of a simplistic there's a good, there's a good um, side and there's a bad side to this conflict. Uh, whilst, again, Norway has played a more responsible role. And Denmark, it's not quite sure to me what is the official policy of Denmark in this respect. I get the sense that they would prefer as a, as a marginal player in the direct consequences of this war um, have maintained a policy of allowing others to do the heavy lifting of justifying this war. Uh, certainly the rise of Mohammed bin Salman uh, in the context of Saudi politics um, comes with a great deal of controversy and conflict within the uh, ruling elite of Saudi Arabia. And it's certainly a byproduct of the failures of Saudi Arabia to uh, secure an immediate and quick victory in Yemen. Um, hopefully, um, if um, those who will come and join me on May the 2nd, when I um, present a more detailed explanation for why this war had to take place in the, fir in the first place, um, I can then provide more details about the nature of the objectives of a certain group of interested parties in Saudi Arabia, why they had to pursue this war at that particular time. Uh, I doubt that the people who actually understand the dynamics of Denmark's relationship with Saudi Arabia or larger European relationship with the, the, the Persian Gulf, the Arab Gulf, are actually um, buying the media campaign that celebrates uh, Mohammed bin Salman as a reformer whose superficial gestures towards giving women the right to drive cars, finally. Uh, is, is, that, is that somehow a indicator that this is indeed return um, for the better uh, for this larger region. I don't think that was, that's part of the calculations that well-informed actors in, uh, in Denmark who have relations, commercial relations with the Middle East actually accept that. I think Denmark, as I will discuss on May 2nd, has um, um, some vested interest in seeing uh, a smooth transition in Saudi Arabia one that continues to have um, one profitable commercial relations, um, but also a useful strategic one. Um, there is a need for a, a viable, sustainable uh, partner, if you will, in the region that um, it does not necessarily reflect the interest of the larger population in the region. Indeed, one could argue that since the arrival of European powers after World War I, the vast majority of people in the Middle East have suffered um, from whether direct colonialism or through these proxy states like the family in Saudi Arabia, indirect European American imperialism. And that's what Yemen has been resisting since the beginning of the 20th century. And I 
provide some kind of historical background as to what Yemen represents as opposed to what the Saudi family, for instance, represents in the European, uh, sorry, in the Middle Eastern, modern Middle Eastern story. Um, so I think this transitional period is not one that is immediately reflective of um, you know, Saudi or Mohammed bin Salman's own kind of masterwork. It's representative of a much larger kind of structural change that's happening in the larger global context. And certainly Denmark and Scandinavia and Europe is very much interested in what happened and very much invested in seeing it happen in certain ways and not others. We are now in the fourth year, beginning of the fourth year of a war that was uh, initiated uh, with the hope that it would be ended quickly and a return, if you will, of some kind of uh, GCC-dictated stability. Uh, over the course of some four years of perpetual constant bombardment um, of targeted areas, which consist mostly of geographically northern Yemen, where upwards of 23 million people live today, who have been isolated um, through a campaign of destruction of infrastructure, uh, destruction of farmlands, destruction of water sources, and indeed uh, uh, absolute embargo of this area where in which 23 million people live. We have now um, unofficial reports. The UN is not very helpful with providing updated information about the numbers of casualties. Uh, officially, the casualties run between 15,000 and 20,000 civilian deaths, not counting the number of people who are carrying guns or would be considered non-civilians who have died in this war. The numbers have not included those who have died of cholera, where upwards of a million people are now infected by cholera, the largest modern-day outbreak of cholera. Um, we know that um, there are at least 15 million people who are suffering um, malnutrition because of this, uh, this war, a country that had once imported 90% of its food is now completely shut off from the system of access to outside sources of food. So we are really um, realistically talking about 20 million people on the throes of starvation on top of the diseases that are caused by um, the lack of drinking water, the lack of medical supplies. We, Medicine Sans Frontieres last year said 63,000 children died in North Yemen due to conditions created by this war. Not that's one year. Um, and because of the politics of numbers and the politics of how this war is presented, we will never actually be allowed to speak about absolute numbers that are accurate. But people on the ground speak of much, much more dramatic health and um, safety situation for people who live in the north. So we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people who are directly affected by this. I mean, we've seen awful pictures of starvation. We've just saw two days ago the um, an air attack on an internally displaced people's refugee camp where some 20 people were killed and hundreds were injured. Um, this is a, day, a daily event, unfortunately, in North Yemen. Uh, at this stage, um, we can rest assured that it's hundreds of thousands of people who are annually um, directly affected by this war.